he wanted to create mystery. So he, he wasn't really hiding behind it. I think the time had uh, a lot to do with your album. Yeah, there were the players on our album. Who, who, who's doing the music? I, I can hear Prince on the album. No, no. I don't hear his voice. Oh, yeah. Who's that on the other end of the phone? Okay. Uh... I'd like to know uh, if Vanity started the original group or did more stay like in the movie. I put a tape together, a demo tape. It had my voice on it. Actually, Prince discovered Vanity Six. I had to leave the group and I wanted to write Right it. before I met him, I wrote Drive Me Wild and Makeup. I wanted to write it myself. To do that, I had to leave the group. And those are the two songs that are on the album. Mainly, that's how it started for me. Uh, a lot of your lyrics are like real explicit. When you're 12 years old, how do you come up with that? I'm 16. <laughs> but she's possibly influenced by, you know, the kids, you know, the kids at school. Oh, yeah. So there'd be tidbits out there. Is Jamie Star Prince? He liked that mystery. It, it was really more kind of between Prince and Morris. Prince's whole thing is he wanted to really kind of white label the thing. Didn't want it to be this obvious Prince, you know, kind of the Spengali deal. And I just, we all thought it was hilarious that people thought that Jamie Star was like a person because the Jamie Star was more a composite. Prince primarily, but then you know, he had Morris's input and. I had a little bit of involvement, and there were a bunch of people that had a little bit of involvement, so. It's, it's well known at this point in time that he loved the movie The Idolmaker, and I think there was the vibe of the, of the time that that film is set in was kind of in that whole, you know, the, the girl groups and that, that whole thing. And I think that was just an idea that hit him and stuck, and he wanted to do, like, the updated version of that. They had given him one of the locker rooms for his dressing room, and I was in there setting everything up, and I'd set up all his stuff on the table for his hair, makeup, jewelry, all whatever. And he came in and looked at me, and we said hello. Um, he had a little boombox that I had set up on on the table, and he put a cassette tape into the boombox. And so I started singing along with it, and I started singing little pieces of harmony with it and stuff like this. And um, I turned around and looked, and he's sitting there staring at me in the mirror. <laughs> saying, I didn't know you could sing. He didn't waste any time. It wasn't like he thought about it and then talked to me later. He just turned around, looked at me, and he said, you could be the other hooker. Jesse had come to town to audition for Prince. He thought Prince was looking for a guitar player. And Prince said, no, I'm not looking for a guitar player. I'm looking for a bass player. And I didn't know at the time that they had this whole thing going where he'd made some deal with Morris over the party up song. As the story goes, Morris actually wrote Party up, party up. Prince took the credit for it. What's the idea that he just let you just have time in his and just say go to the studio and which was in his house? And yeah, just because cut stuff. Yeah, because I was over there all the time. So yeah. you know, he's like, and I'm doing the video thing for him, and so he's like, if you want to go in the studio, and I'm like, I didn't let him finish. I'm like, I'm in there, you know. Right, exactly. So I start cutting a groove, yep. you know, do the drums, yep. doing the bass line, but I'm doing. But I was yeah. in there. I go home. I come back the next day. Mm -hmm. He turned himself loose in the studio yeah, all right, night. Right. He plays me the song. Complete song. Party up. Then changed it up and everything. And he's mm -hmm. like, you know, I want this song. And you know the story. You guys cut the Time album at uh, Prince's We house. basically then came into everything. And we just heard the album and we're like, this is amazing. And there was always kind of a thought that people had. Don't you feel like, you know, you should have been a part of whatever, whatever. And I'm like, no, not when we heard what it was. Prince basically made those records. I mean, we, our involvement in those records was very minimal. So Prince in the, the, the early days did all the music. That was just the way it was. And we were absolutely OK with that. We always knew that this was Morris's thing. As Terry said, Prince was doing all the music and basically doing everything, him and Morris. That first record that we cut together, I the mean, songs are coming out magic. We laughed, partied, we went out to the club, cut this, a lot of it in the house. Prince had a studio there. But you used to go over and just cut songs with him. Yeah. We just jam. It would basically be Morris on the drums, Prince on the bass, and they would just play. Prince would, in his mind, think this might be just a jam session. Well, this might be a, pr a verse, this might be a chorus. He, you listen to it back, you put the chords over the top of it, and then the little horn stabs and stuff you do based on the breaks and some of that other stuff. Let the drums and the bass line dictate what you then put on top of it. I would go because it's the studio, and then the the girl I was dating was like, man, I think you guys are having an affair. And I'm like, get the fuck out here. You know how to make records. Call me, too. Morris is a witness to this. Drive way out there in the middle of the night. I don't think I want to record or something. 
Someone that got me out there because the machine broke. He's like, he just gonna pay the dues to be in this. Okay, you call me at any hour. Some nights, two o'clock in the morning, the cops are knocking. <laughs> You guys got to stop, you know, the music's reflecting across the lake and, you know, the neighbors are up. And so, you know, just those times, man, we were living musically and friendship enriched. Yeah, yeah, Prince called me when they were finishing up the record. He needed some lyrics. He had to, he just had to tie them cool. By that point in time, he, you know, had respect for my lyric writing ability. He said, hey, can you write some lyrics for this? So I said, yeah, I, I called him back later and said, here you go. Uh, gave him the lyrics and... That was that. And we knew that the general direction of the image that, that he was going for with, with Morris was a, the cool thing. Our big dilemma was, well, if Morris is the drummer, what happens to Jellybee? So we had two dilemmas. We actually had one dilemma because Alexander O'Neill was the lead singer. Morris and Prince had called me and asked me to have a meeting with him. So Prince called a, a dinner at uh, Perkins Cake and Steak House. I like steak and salad at Perkins and uh, <laughs> pretty girls. I, I hate to break it to you, my man. It wasn't Perkins. I, I'm, I'm gonna take you back. Sambo's on Lake Street. We went to this restaurant called Rudolph's. So anyway, we sit down. And we're all gonna have dinner, basically, and Prince is gonna kind of lay out the game plan of what we're gonna do. But Alex always speaks in the third person. Me to sit back and be passive. I wouldn't have been Alexander O'Neill. We ordered food. Prince is buying some. Alex orders a big steak. So Alex goes, okay, Prince, before we get started and things like that, that, you know, I had a few things I didn't want to get off my chest. I thought that, you know, we were in a position where we were close to getting a deal ourselves because we were in the studio doing things. I was questioning them about their decision to be the time. Alex couldn't see eye to eye with, with Prince about the paper. You know, Prince, I need the paper. I need some paper, Prince. Alex really showed his butt and said he wanted to know how much paper was involved. And Prince wasn't having it. You know, it wasn't about that. You know, the paper's going to come later, but right now, you know, we're trying to build a step. And we're all, like, looking at Alex, like, what What are you doing, man? And he's like, here's the thing. So, you know, how does that O'Neill, you know, first of all, how does that O'Neill need, you know, I need a new house. I started asking questions in reference to the financial aspect of, of this venture. Yeah, I need a moving thing. You know, how does that O'Neill need, you know, I just need some things. You know, I know this, this whole record thing is real cute now and all that stuff there, but this, you know, how does that O'Neill need some things? You know what I'm saying, Prince? You know, Prince, that's just the way I see it. So I'm going to go ahead and throw down and see a steak. <laughs> he threw down the steak. Prince and Morris look at each other and leave the restaurant. So now we're like going, man, what are you doing, Alex? Just, you know, trying try to point out a few things, you know. Here's the way it is with Alexander O'Neill. You know, if there's a bear in the woods and Alexander O'Neill, you better help the bear because you ain't got to help Alexander O'Neill. Alex was supposed to be the singer. Yes. Alexander O'Neill. Yes. Xander wanted more no paper. Yeah. We didn't have the paper. Yeah. So Xander said, no, no Xander. Right. So long story short, I got fired. So consequently, obviously, I guess Prince taking an attitude that you have the nerve to question me. Uh, I went to rehearsal one night. And he said, we're not going to have a session tonight. Morris and I are going down on First Avenue. And he gave me $50 and I was out. And that was it. And Alex was done. Bean was the drummer. He got the word. Right. Now, Tina Easton has a hit record out entitled Sugar Walls, and it was written by a gentleman by the name of Alexander Nevermind, who many people allege is Prince, one of his uh, pseudo names. And uh, a lot of people say he's sending a message to you uh, through that. Uh, how do you respond to that? Well, you know, Doug, that could, that could very well be true, that he's sending a message to, to Alexander O'Neill. But uh, I don't uh, interpolate that as a lot of people probably think I do, uh, I happen to feel that that's a very, very positive thing, and, and definitely coming from Prince, that's a very, very, it's a compliment, you know, and that's the way that I take that. And he just said, Alexander Neal is out, more stays the lead singer. Prince was instrumental in pushing me out. I said, I don't know how to be a front man. I said, he said, well, be cool. I said, what? He said, put your hand in your pocket. So I did that. If you look at the first video, cool video, my hand was in my pocket, right. never left. But that was the first place people knew I was just so nervous, and the people were going nuts. And that feeling was incredible. And I was thinking to myself, okay, yeah, this is what I thought this was going to be like, <laughs> you know. And by the time we got to the arena, right, insane. As great as Prince was, he pulled stuff from all of us. We used to we practice. Used to always joke about it, say, yeah, tomorrow we're going to hear that on Warner Brothers Records and Tapes, <laughs> because that's exactly what would happen. But it was all good. We were funkier. So whenever Prince wanted to work something out, he'd come with our band. As he'd come over and he'd start jamming, and we'd all start jamming, and all of a sudden somebody would press record on the cassette, and we'd play for an hour or something, then we'd walk out, Prince would pop out the cassette. 
And the next day we'd hear something very similar to what it was we jammed on, you know? So it got to the point where Prince would walk into to rehearsal, he'd start jamming, and we'd all kind of go, yeah, I think I'm going to get some need. Uh, I think I'm going to, you know, we'd be like, because we're like, or or I'd be noodling around on the keyboard and then he'd go, Jimmy Jam, what's that you're playing? What you're playing, Jimmy Jam? What are you playing? Because all I needed to do on 777 was just do a, a bass line. And all I would do was, that's all I would do. Jimmy Jam, what are you doing with your right hand? I'm not doing anything, Prince. I'm just I'm copying the bass line of the song. You should play the chords that Monty's playing. I said, Monty's already playing the chords, but you got to play the chords because it makes it bigger, sound better than the record. Okay, so now I'm playing. Jimmy Jam, what note are you singing on the chorus? I'm not singing a part, Prince. Find a note and sing. It's got to be bigger than the record. Seven, 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 three. Jimmy Jam, how come you're not doing the choreography? Prince! I'm standing at a keyboard, man. I what choreography? Choreography is simple. You should be able to do the choreography. Seven, seven, seven. Let's hear seven, 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 ninety three, eleven. Okay. So we come in, and we come in, and we come. Seven, 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 ninety three, eleven. So the point of the story is now. Not only can I do all of those things, I can take my hanky off. I can tip my hat. I can peek over my glasses. I can put my hand in my pocket when I'm not playing. That that taught me, it's like, you can do a whole lot of stuff you don't even know you can do. Because, you know, them two grew up together as kids, Morris and him. So Morris would be sitting at the board with him, and he would be crying. Because they're hilarious. They're the funniest <laughs> dudes. They are the funny. Morris is probably one of the funniest dudes you ever meet. And he's off the cuff with it. Like on stage, a girl came up and had this top on, and she had a you know, was like tied in the back of the boat and just on the top of his head, he got ready to touch the string. He's like, I'm about to go from PG to double D. Like, <laughs> um, comedians had a, a great deal of effect on my music, I think. Really in so much is that the um, bands that I were with, all the bands I've had, we always had those records going on. You know, all the top comedy records. It was always a challenge to be funny in music. It's always a challenge to have some sort of humor in a song. At the end of the day, Jamie Starr was... Uh... He was a creation of, <laughs> of people's imaginations. They believe what they wanted to believe. Right. I think, honestly, he was still trying to keep the sort of the pure, like, funk sound, to have a place for that, to have a repository for that, so that he would not feel that he had to keep that present in his work as Prince, so that he had a place to go with with that material. And really... It wasn't, it was as much a fact that that was what he loved and it was part of him as it was, you know, a commercial consideration or a financial consideration. So that's, I, I believe that's really what it was. It was some place to keep the fun. The live performance of those records, that's why we used to go out and try to kick his ass every night. They were, to be perfectly honest, the only band I was afraid of. And rightfully so. Yes. <laughs> because every night we tried to kick his ass. <laughs> they were turning into Godzilla. Some things are better left unsaid And some people are better left untrusted